This is The Daily Space for today, Monday, June 8th, 2020. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brain. As was felt last Monday, this week continues with a dichotomy of emotions that are, that are really hard to sort. On the one hand, NASA has put out its call for media credentialing for the Mars Perseverance launch, which is normally the sign that all is good and it's time to be excited about robots in space. At the same time, protesters across the U.S. are continuing to call for an end to racial injustice and are being met with violence that is sending people to hospitals for standing in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like many, I find myself unable to celebrate anything, not even a new robot going to Mars. While I see so many reminding us of what what they've gone through as minorities in America. As a woman in astronomy, I've experienced extreme harassment and continual social bias. I've spoken at length about this, and I would encourage you to find our Astronomy Cast episode on sexual harassment in astronomy. Nevertheless, as a white woman, I find myself in the company of a support system of other women. We make up roughly 10 to 15% of the profession. And while that's too few women, and while I have been the only woman in far too many circumstances, I still see people who look like me at all large events. For people of color, the situation is far worse. With there being less than 100 PhDs granted to African Americans in astronomy in the history of this nation. I can't pretend to understand what they experience and want to instead take this moment to quote from particlesforjustice.org. From their website, they write, We recognize that our academic institutions and research collaborations, despite big talk about diversity, quality, and inclusion, have ultimately failed black people. Demands for justice have been met with gradualism and tokenism, as well as diversity and inclusion initiatives that, while sometimes well-intentioned, have had little meaningful impact on the lived experiences of black students, staff, researchers, and faculty. Black representation among physics faculty is non-existent at most institutions, and it is widely known that black students often feel unwelcome, unsupported, and even unsafe in their physics departments and predominantly white campuses. Continuing to read from their letter to the profession. We call for a universal strike to give them a break, and because those of us with the most privilege have the greatest responsibility to use that privilege to enact change. We must confront the institutional barriers to justice for black people in academia and beyond, challenge the notion of meritocracy, whereby objective and neutral criteria infused with systematic racism are used to exclude black people from physics and other academic disciplines. And we want to rebuild our institutions and collaborations in a way that is just and equitable. Importantly, we are not calling for more diversity and inclusion talks and seminars. We are not asking people to sit through another training about implicit bias. We are calling for every member of the community to commit to taking actions that will change the material circumstances of how black lives are lived to work toward ending the white supremacy that not only snuffs out black physicists' dreams, but destroys whole black lives. In calling for a strike, we call on blacks, we call on, sorry, we call on people who are not black to spend a day undertaking discussion and action that furthers this work while providing black scientists with a day of rest. Every single institution around the world can and should get involved in this work, and the strike marks an opportunity to recommit to the humanist values which should underpin academic work, including the belief that black lives matter. We here at CosmoQuest X on Twitch will go dark on Wednesday in solidarity with Strike for Black Lives. We are moving our popular Rocket Roundup show to tomorrow, Tuesday. Each of us, in our own way, will do what we can to carry the load that others might rest. And we would encourage all of you to do the same. For today, however, we do have science. 
Last week, we ran a story on how fast radio bursts had been, at least in the case of four of these super energetic events. They had been localized to the outskirts of galaxies. Today, we get word from Jodrell Banks Observatory that across four years' observations, they have discovered a really weird repeating pattern of behavior in fast radio burst 121102. This pattern could only be discovered thanks to regular monitoring by the giant 76-meter Lovell telescope. Over these many years, they found this object will go quiet for roughly 67 days at a time and then become active with irregular bursts of radio emission scattered through a 90-day window. These, this randomness of the outbursts in that window is something we're not used to seeing in astronomy. But this kind of behavior is seen in another fast radio burst, FRB 180916.JU10158 plus 56. While the latter has a significantly longer designation, its outburst cycle is 10 times shorter than that of 121102. It's still not clear what these objects are, but this kind of a burst behavior is consistent with the outbursts being tied to some sort of an orbital pattern and a high mass or extreme object. This work, however, seems to maybe rule out a cause of magnetic precession. But since magnetic fields aren't well understood, we might want to leave that possibility on the table for now. We really don't know. It's, it's a complex situation. But we're starting to get data, and that's going to hopefully eventually allow us to understand what these are. In addition to spotting high energy events like fast radio bursts, radio telescopes also allow us to see processes in the sky that are blocked by gas and dust and hidden from our optical like telescopes. This is what has made these radio dishes such amazing tools for studying baby stars and their surrounding disks that may someday form solar systems. Radio telescopes, however, are not all equally able to peer through the dust. The much beloved Atacama Large Millimeter Array, for instance, sees the sky in wavelengths of light that are measured in millimeters, that's the name, and fractions of millimeters. And this lets them see many planets forming disks in amazing detail. But what has confused many, however, is Alma's inability to make out twin disks in the youngest of binary star systems. These very young warm disks are called hot Carino. And um, they are rich in complex organic molecules that can seed forming planets with the chemistry needed to someday form life. Since both stars and binary systems are expected to form at the same time, it was expected that we'd see Carino dis disks and eventually planets forming at the same time around both stars. But with the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, only one star has ever been seen to have the Carino in these binary systems. So scientists decided to go long and use the very large array to look for light from Carinos in centimeter wavelengths. And they found them. According to principal investor Claire Chandler from NRAO, we decided to look for, em for evidence of these chemicals at longer wavelengths that can easily pass through dust. Now, according to, to Claire from the National Radio Astronomical Observatory, who's also a principal investigator on this project, it struck us that dust might be what was preventing us from detecting the molecules in one of the twin protostars. This difference in dust may be an alignment issue or due to interactions between the two systems. Interestingly, Carino hasn't been seen in single, single star systems yet. It will be interesting to see if this go long with centimeter light approach allows more of these earliest stages in planetary disk formation to be seen. These, there are certain things in astronomy, dusk be, dust being one of them, magnetic fields being another, that are just really hard to understand. So every little step we make is really a major step forward.
Today's news really is just full of both dust and magnetic fields. Our final story carries us from dusty forming worlds to dust forming between the stars. We've long known from observations that complex atoms, including chlorofluorocarbons and polycyclic hydrocarbons, can be found in space. How they get there has been challenging to explain. But new work from the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy has sought to recreate in a lab what happens in space, and they're starting to succeed. Dust grains are extremely complex structures where many different molecules can interact across surface areas, and the overall size of the structure is something we're still trying to consistently figure out. Now, left alone, molecules in dust might slowly grow through collisions, but would otherwise stay constant in their composition and structure, we think. The thing is, dust is never really left alone when it's in space. Dust molecules are regularly bombarded with cosmic rays, with random atoms, and the ionizing ultraviolet light of our sun and other stars. All these factors allow chemistry to take place and for new and ever more complex atoms to slowly develop. It was thought that ices coating the dust might slow or prevent this kind of chemical evolution. It was also thought that dust grains were fairly round or oval in shape and thus didn't have a whole lot of surface area. But Experimental work by Alexei Potapov and his research team has determined the ices are actually thin on the surface and the complex and the structures are extraordinarily complex. And this combination means that ice is really no barrier to chemistry. To quote from the press release during the experiment, A laser is pointed at a graphite specimen, eroding, oblating, minute particles from the surface, mere nanometers across, where one nanometer is one billionth of a meter. Instead of grains completely covered with several layers of solid ice, water ice or carbon monoxide ice, like an onion, the dust grains produced in the laboratory stayed as close as possible to the realistic deep space conditions were extended, many trendled shapes, fluffy networks of dust and ice. This complex shape they discovered gave them 100 times the surface area we'd seen when simpler structures in different models were used. And these new structures allow more room for chemistry. This is a revelation. The onion model has been the typical way of looking at dust models in the past. And now with this completely different structure, which again, this is a laboratory experiment. They actually recreated interstellar space in a chamber in Germany. And they were able to recreate the chemistry of space in a lab in Germany. And now we're just going to have to completely rethink the formation of complex molecules, and it's gotten a whole lot easier with this new, fluffier understanding of the shape of dust. And that's all I've got for today's episode. This has been The Daily Space. I'm really hoping that the world gets better, freer, more equal in the future, and we can dedicate these episodes strictly to science. But until everyone is free, to be able to do science, we have to acknowledge that inequality because we don't know what minds we're accidentally wasting just by closing doors on reasons that are on the outside when it's science that happens on the inside. Anyways, my name is Dr. Pamela Gay. I've been your host and I wrote today's episode. This episode will be engineered by Ali Pelfrey and our web content produced by Beth Johnson. We are a product of the Planetary Science Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit dedicated to exploring our solar system and beyond. I'm now going to hang around and answer your questions. Let's see what you've got in here. Scrolling to the top. Hello, everyone. And I have to concur with Paranor. 
uh, Jillian Georgine, who goes by Jillian Rhodes in real life, hosted this morning's community coffee, and it was amazing. Tropical Tom, thank you for the bits. I have doggos down here. Eddie is now howling upstairs. Um, I don't appear to have a dog camera or Cheerios. Come here, Veronica Cure. Thank you for giving out a community sub. Come here, baby girl. Come here. Come here. You are not coming. Whoa. Come here. No, no. Dog. Okay. I'm going to give up on giving the dog to you as a cute prize. Come here. She's now afraid of me because I caused her to slip and fall off the arm of the chair. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, our Insta. Okay, fine. I'm going to figure out how to add dog cam back. Um, let's get dog cam. It, my computer seems to think that I have unplugged my camera. Um, let's... Which, indeed, I have apparently unplugged my camera. There is no dog cam today. All right. I'm just going to have to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your bits, your gift sub, and your more bits. Um, you guys are awesome. Okay. Looking to see what else has happened. Um... Thank you, Guido, for 25 months of being a sub on Twitch with us. Thank you. Um, looking to see what is going on. <sighs> Looks like a lot of you are having web issues. Sorry about that. Um, sorry, I'm pausing to read as I go. So Hanny asks, are dust grains accumulated through gravity or static? Um, it's, it's usually via, they hit each other and they stick together through chemical processes. They can gravitationally attract each other, but really chemistry via collisions is way more effective, way more effective. Um, Michael, this isn't necessarily panspermia, but this is the making sure that the stuff that the life, when it eventually forms, needs is created by the universe before the life needs it. Um, it's just getting ready for life. Um, let's see what else we have down here. I love that the snowmen are still a thing. We are so far away from snow season. Um, yeah, Hanny, I think Eddie did do a, why does no one see the squirrel? It was definitely the noise he makes for something other than the postman. Thank you, Guido. I already thanked you, but I'm going to thank you again because I just hit that point in the chat. Um, it is a lot of months, Walker. It's squad goals, definitely. Um... Okay, I seem to have hit the end of chat, and I do have a telecon that is scheduled the exact same time as Daily Space. But I'm trying to get moved, but I haven't succeeded yet. Oh, our Insta is saying, in the notes, did they explain why they thought dust would be made spherical or blobby instead of fluffy and made of thin bits? Uh, that's just how we've always thought it. It's how I learned it in grad school. It's how they learned it in grad school. I don't know who eventually, I don't know who uh, ultimately came up with the idea originally. It's just the way people thought it happened and people were wrong. Um... So the scale of the images, um, so this particular image, uh, I don't know if you can read the scale bars, the one on the left, this bar right here is five nanometers. And the one on the right, this bar right here is 100 nanometers. So we're looking at things smaller than the tip of a piece of hair. Um, yeah, it's really cool. But as I was saying, I have a coincidentally scheduled telecon telecon 
So I'm going to go telecon. We will be hosting open space here tonight as a simulcast that is at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. I don't know if Fraser has a guest tonight. Um, we will have a guest, I believe, on Thursday. So more science to come. And let's work on making our world a little bit better so everyone can equally participate, not just in science, but in living. So thank you, everyone. This has been The Daily Space. I have been your host for today, and I wrote today's episode. My name is Dr. Pamela Gay. This episode will be engineered by Ali Pelfrey and our web content produced by Beth Johnson. We are here thanks to the generous support of all of you, your volunteerism, your bits, your subs, your patronage at patreon.com slash CosmoQuestX would allow our episodes to take place. We would not be here without you. And that here is the 501c3 nonprofit, the Planetary Science Institute. This means your donations are tax deductible or allowed by law. Clearly, I got that out of order today. Anyways, before I screw up saying anything else, who should we raid, people? Who should we raid? Ooh, I don't have all my windows open today. Let me open the rest of my windows. We um Pluto is not a planet. It is a minor planet. It is a dwarf planet, but it is a world. Go with the word world. It doesn't have a scientific definition. So we're all safe. Um, just a Dutch guy. Sure, I will rate them. I'm open to new rates. All right, everyone. Wherever you are in the world, stay safe. Make the world a little bit better for everyone else. Wear a mask if you have to go outside. Take care of yourself. No matter what, I don't know how to end this anymore. I can wish for you to have a good day, but I know it's hard. What I can tell you is we're going to be here tomorrow and for many more tomorrows, and we're going to get through all of this together. Bye-bye, everyone. Mm -hmm.